According to newly discovered information, the National Archives back in October squashed any claims that President Biden may have access to classified documents just three weeks before the documents were discovered in his think tank in Washington, D.C. Dr. Lena Wen, a CNN political commentator and Washington Post writer, has come out and written an article saying that the CDC may be overcounting COVID deaths, and she is under fire for doing so. The District of Columbia may be enacting an overhaul of its longstanding criminal code. And finally, I give a brief primer on the fascinating history of modern day India. I'm Julie Hartman, and this is Timeless. It is Wednesday, January 18th, 2023. And now for the timely part of Timeless, here is the news that you have to know today. According to a Fox News article, the National Archives just three weeks before the first batch of Biden documents were discovered in the closet of his think tank, strongly dismissed claims that President Biden may have mishandled documents from his time as vice president. On October 11, 2022, the National Archives and Records Administration, known as NARA, responded to questions about the possibility of the possession of classified documents. And they released a statement, again in October of last year, saying, quote, reports that indicate or imply that those presidential records were in the possession of the former president or their representatives after they left office, or that the records were housed in substandard conditions are false and misleading. NARA also said that, quote, all documents from the Obama administration had been, quote, securely moved to locations that met strict, strict archival and security standards. So NARA has not commented in recent months and weeks on whether President Biden's think tank closet or whether his garage in Delaware meet those strict security standards. This, unfortunately, is not the first time in the last couple of months that we have seen major national institutions either lie or severely mishandle a situation. We're all aware, for instance, of the information that has come out as the result of the Twitter files that has exposed the corruption of the FBI. Among other things, we know that the FBI gave $3.4 million to Twitter in 2020. Now, why is a government organization that is in charge of homeland security giving that big of a payout to a private corporation? Seem a little shady to you? I think so. Also, we know from the Twitter files that several former FBI employees at, left the FBI and went to work at Twitter. And one of those former FBI employees, James Baker, who happened to be the general counsel of the FBI, was the man that was solely in charge of squashing the Hunter Biden story when the New York Post originally reported on it on my birthday in 2020. That's October 14th, 2020. In addition, the Bureau of Labor Statistics has also been found out to have deceived the American public. The BLS is a part of the U.S. Department of Labor, and it announced in July that one million jobs had been created under President Biden from April 1st to June 30th. That's the second economic quarter. So President Biden used this statistic and put it on his uh, White House website and bragged about it in speeches, and he used it to bolster himself and the Democratic Party in anticipation of the upcoming 2022 midterms. But there was just one problem. It wasn't true. In December of 2022, the BLS, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, quietly announced that it made an error and that it wasn't that a million jobs were created in the second economic quarter under President Biden, but only 10,000 jobs Oopsies, 10,000 is just, you know, only 1% of 1 million. So not like that's a severe uh, mistake that they made there. But nevertheless, 
they did it quietly, they announced this mistake quietly, and we have not seen the mainstream media report on it in the way that they should. But still, it's another government organization that duped us. And then the third example most recently is, of course, what I just told you about the National Archives, who seem to be so confident that there were no documents. They said that it was false and misleading of anyone to speculate that President Biden may have mishandled classified material. How were they so confident? And especially three weeks before this bombshell report came out. And why is it that these institutions, errors, and if you, it's probably generous to call them errors, it's more accurately to describe, more accurate to describe them as lies. Why is it that all of these institutions' lies seem to benefit the Democratic Party exclusively? Every single time it seems to work in their favor. It does not inspire confidence in any of us Americans that our institutions are honest and partisan anymore. Now, speaking of honesty, that did come a little late, but at least it came. Dr. Lena Wen, who is a CNN medical analyst and a Washington Post columnist, is under fire for a column that she published last Friday in which she claimed that doctors are, quote, overcounting COVID deaths and hospitalizations. So Dr. Wen was analyzing CDC data, and she also uh, pulled material from var various hospital records and talked with many epidemiologists and other doctors. And she speculated in her article that the medical community is overcounting COVID deaths by 30%. And she says that the reason for this is that, that they're counting people who died with COVID as people who died from COVID. And she said in her article, and it's an, it's an excellent point, how important it is that we be precise about this information so that Americans are properly informed about their true risk of hospitalization and death as a result of this virus. So Dr. Wen, as I mentioned, is under fire for this, but she's not so much under fire from the political left as she is from the political right. Many doctors have taken to Twitter to essentially ask why she is so late in coming out with this article. Again, she is a prolific commentator who has been writing about COVID for two and a half years now. And this is the first article that she has written acknowledging the overcounting. The Brownstone Institute president, Jeffrey Tucker, for instance, tweeted, quote, this is not recently true. This has been true for three years. Another doctor said, really, it's taken you 2.5 years to finally acknowledge this? So Dr. Wen does deserve some pushback for just writing about this now when there has been a lot of evidence that we have known to be true that many hospitals have overcounted the deaths. And although it certainly is disappointing to see her wait until it is politically advantageous for her to make this admission. I want to highlight the story for you because I think there is a glimpse of good news in this. And that is, the truth does seem often to come out. That's not always true. And certainly it's, it's not always the case that the truth comes out in the timeline that we would want it to. But sooner or later, you can run, but you can't hide from the truth. And on a personal note, I remember in the summer of 2020 when I uh, discovered that I had some conservative beliefs, I was debating whether or not to come out and be as public uh, about my feelings. You can see that <laughs> I made the decision pretty fast to be public about them, but still, I went through a period of debate. And because even though I could see so clearly that Black Lives Matter, for instance, was a fraudulent organization, that it really didn't want to do anything to help black people, it was very unpopular to come out so strongly against the organization at that time, even though it was as clear as day that the people running it were fraudsters. They got $2 billion in donations and they didn't outline any plan as to what they were going to do with it. And then now, of course, it has come out that the leaders have embezzled several uh, millions of dollars to buy private homes for themselves. But still, the reason why I chose to be public about my beliefs is because of this understanding I had that if something is true, it will come out. 
And even though at the time it wasn't popular for me to condemn Black Lives Matter, now that, that my statements seem to have aged well. And if you look at even what I just reported on in the previous story, the information about the FBI came out through the Twitter files, the information about the National Archives's, uh, Archives's, <laughs> Archives apostrophe S's uh, lies have come out, the Bureau of Labor Statistics error has come out, and now this overcounting COVID deaths has come out. So this should be a guiding light for all of us. And finally, the third news story that you have to know today, I want to put it on your radar, is that the District of Columbia, the DC Council, which by the way is the principal policymaking body for DC since DC is not a state, they voted yesterday to override DC Mayor Muriel Bowser's veto of a sweeping overhaul of the District of Columbia's criminal code. So this bill that the DC Council passed is set to go to our United States Congress for a 60-day review, and we should all hope that the Republicans leading the U.S. House will squash this bill, because if it is enacted, it will overhaul the criminal code that has existed in D.C. for the past 100 years. And here are some of the things that it will do. Number one, it will allow jury trials for misdemeanors. Number two, it will eliminate most mandatory minimum sentencing. And number three, it will reduce mandatory maximum penalties for crimes. By the way, doesn't that seem a little bit inverted to you? That the first thing that I mentioned, allowing jury trials for mister misdemeanors, seems like they're putting a lot more money and effort towards prosecuting people for smaller crimes, but then when it comes to the bigger crimes, they seem to be wanting to give criminals a pass by eliminating the mandatory minimum sentencing and reducing the maximum penalties. So again, if this is passed, hopefully it is not, it will be phased in in the year 2025. It will cost DC hundreds of millions of dollars. The estimate is about 50 million. And perhaps most importantly, thousands and thousands and thousands of people will die. This story is so important and I wanna give you this fact to put in your arsenal that any time a leftist says, oh, conservatives over-exaggerate the extent to which we want to overhaul policing and the criminal system. You bring up this fact to them and say, no, it is not true. Look at what the District of Columbia is trying to do now. Or how about the fact that as I reported on a few days ago, the state of Illinois in 2023 is the first state to eliminate cash bail, which means that if a criminal is arrested, he doesn't, he or she, most, I say he because most criminals, violent criminals are male, he does not have to pay bail in many cases and will be released to go back onto the street and kill more people. So we all need to be aware of these policies that continue to ha happen despite the fact that the Democrats want to claim that they are not. And finally, as part of our second half of the show today, I want to give you a brief primer on the fascinating history of India. With regard to international relations, it seems that most Americans are very focused on China's authoritarianism and on Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And understandably so, those are two of our most principal adversaries and those are two big stories. But there is a third country that we ought to all be paying close attention to, and that is India. Last month, I interviewed Andrew Bustamante, who is a former undercover CIA officer. If you haven't seen that interview, I highly encourage you to watch it. The episode name is called The Company, and he is riveting. We talked for close to two hours until we had to get off of the interview. And he told me that as part of the application process for the CIA, the CIA actually makes their recruits write a lot of essays. And one of the essay prompts that he mentioned was that the CIA asks recruits to identify three countries that the recruit thinks poses the biggest threat to United States power in the next five to 10 years. Unsurprisingly, oh, so sorry, I should say, I uh, asked uh, Mr. Bustamante how he would answer that question now. And unsurprisingly, he told me 
number one, China, number two, Russia, but number three stunned me a little bit. He said India. India in the past 100 years, like China, has had a stunning ascent. Less than just 80 years ago, India was a colony of the British Empire. And it was, once it got independence in 1947, it was a relatively economically backward socialist country. In just the first 40 years of its independence, there were three assassinations of Indian leaders. There were several dozens of terrorist attacks and there was widespread poverty among the populace, which led to a lot of migration out of India into countries like the United States. But now, oh, how the tables have turned. India has a population of 1.408 billion people, which is only 4 million people less than the most populous country, China, which stands at 1.412 billion people. By the way, it was recently reported that China, for the first time in several decades, experienced actually uh, a decline in population growth in the past year. The decline was only about a million people, and given that China's in the billions, it's not that big of a deal for them, but still, it is worth noting. India is actually expected to surpass China in population size within the next few years. And India also has one of the fastest growing populations of young people. In 2021, India had 360 million people under the age of 14, which is 112 million more than China has in that age group. And this population, again, not unlike the Chinese population, is increasingly more educated, technically skilled, and very hardworking. India's economy also is now ranked as the fifth biggest in the world, but it is expected to be the third largest economy in the world by 2030, which will only be surpassed by the United States and China. And the current prime minister of India, Narendra Modi, is a controversial figure. We're going to get more into Modi in just a few minutes, and specifically his Hindu nationalism and his fraught relations with the Muslim population of India. But despite how one may feel about Modi, it is undeniable that he has shrewdly navigated his country's ascent by taking India away from its uh, socialist past and bringing it in a more pro-business and pro-capitalist direction. India in the past two decades has developed a robust IT and cyber development sectors. And Modi has shrewdly pursued the policy of non-alignment, which means that India does not ally with strongly with any other country. For instance, it remains pretty much silent on political or cultural issues pertaining to China or Russia and the United States and just takes all of those countries' businesses. India is one of the top importers of Russian oil. But then also, on the other hand, India is the most hospitable place to American business. And that is pretty stunning. It's, it's difficult to think of a country that exhibits that same amount of flexibility because usually countries are sort of uh, either ideologically aligned with China or Russia and will only do business with them, or they are ide ideologically aligned with the West, Europe, and the United States and will only do business with that part of the world. So again, the flexibility that Modi has facilitated in India under his prime ministership by the way, is that a word, prime ministership? Look that up, Sean. He's, he's nodding. We'll go with it. The flexibility that he has uh, facilitated is just stunning. So let's talk a little bit about the background, the history of India. The Indian subcontinent, which now is comprised of India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and Sri, Sri Lanka, excuse me, was once a part of the Mughal Empire, which was a dynasty, interestingly, of Muslim leaders that ruled over primarily a Hindu population. But these Mughals were not very involved leaders. They were really pretty much figureheads. So from about 1600, to 1858, that's two and a half centuries, India was greatly influenced by, and in fact, 
almost entirely ruled over by the English East India Company, which was later known famously as the British East India Company. The English East India Company was a private corporation that had private investors as owners, and Queen Elizabeth I of England in 1600 granted this company a charter, giving it the right to trade in India. Now you may ask, Weren't there people there? Wasn't India at the time ruled by the Mughals? How could the English just come in there and set up shop and tr trade? And the answer is that the British Empire didn't give a frosted flake who was in India. In the same way, they didn't give a frosted flake that the Native Americans were living in the North American colonies when the King of England granted the Virginia Company a charter to go to uh, America and trade. So if they saw a economically advantageous opportunity, they used their might and their willpower to sail on in and set up shop. So the East India Company, du during that two and a half centuries that they ruled, acquired and traded spices, textiles, and other luxury goods from India. And it organized itself um, from bases along the coastline, which they called factories. But during the course of the 1600s and the 1700s, the East India Company came to operate more as a colonial government than just a company that was uh, in the region. They maintained its, their own civil bureaucracy and even their own armed forces thanks to the British Army and Navy. So by 1818, the East India Company controlled almost the entire country of modern day India. And interestingly, unlike other places where the British Empire ruled, the East India Company's dominance over India was one primarily of resource extraction and tax collection, rather than displacing a native population from their land and replacing that native population with British settlers. This is, of course, what happened in North America. They displaced the uh, American Indians with British settlers. This also happened in Australia, New Zealand, Southern Africa, and the Caribbean. But the British allowed the native population of India to stay there. So in 1857, finally, that native population had enough, and there was an uprising against the English East India Company, which Indians call the First War of Independence. But unsurprisingly, the British won in that struggle and they changed the rule of the East, English East India Company to outright British colonial rule. So the British government now ruled India, not just in fact, but also in name. And shortly after the 1857 war, the British prime minister declared Queen Victoria of Britain to be the Empress of India. So for 90 years, from 1857 to 1947, the British Raj, which was the British colonial rule, held India as a colony. They pursued a lot of public works projects, infrastructure, and educational projects. For instance, they established a code of law, a court system, they, bu they built hospitals, sewers, plumbing systems, schools, and even the famous Bombay train system, which I encourage you all to look up. It is just a marvelous architectural structure. And despite these British good deeds, clearly, the native population of India did not want them there because the British were in charge. They were masters in someone else's home. So the time for independence came after World War II in 1947. Finally, the Indian population had enough once and for all, and we started to see a lot of movements demanding their independence. This, of course, is when Mahatma Gandhi rose to prominence. Gandhi was a Hindu spiritual leader. He was trained as a lawyer. In fact, he was a, a big proponent of the caste, caste system. And he became known for leading a nonviolent movement for Indian independence. In fact, Martin Luther King Jr., who I talked about on this show yesterday, modeled himself off of Gandhi's nonviolent civil disobedience. And a quick aside about Gandhi. We have been taught in the United States that Gandhi epitomizes cultural purity. 
But he was not as innocent or as guileless as people make him out to be. He was very much clued into public relations and branding, and he knew that he was becoming quite famous as a world leader and sort of played to his audience. And in addition, I will leave the details of this for you to look up online, but Gandhi allegedly had improper relations with several women, including his young grandnieces, who were 60 years younger than he was. In addition to the pro-independence uprisings in India in 1947, the British also decided after World War II that it just did not make sense for them to continue to maintain a colony. They were decimated after the war and they just did not have the financial resources, the personnel, or really the interest in continuing to rule over this faraway place. So in 1947, the territory of colonial India, called the Indian subcontinent, which again encompassed modern day India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and Sri Lanka, was granted independence by the United Kingdom. It seemed up until the moment of independence that India might be one independent country, but the British decided instead to split it into two countries, one that was majority Hindu and one that was majority Muslim. And this is because the Indian subcontinent was already sort of divided along these religious lines. About three quarters of the subcontinent was Hindu and about one quarter was Muslim. But during their status as colonized people, these religious differences were not as calcified or as prominent as they are today. But then once the British granted the subcontinent independence in 1947, the Hindus started to worry that if the Muslims took over, then they would be persecuted. And the Muslims started to worry that if the Hindus took over, they would be persecuted. So uh, they, engaged, unfortunately, in a bloody civil war of religious segregation and self-segregation. India's two most powerful Hindu leaders, Mahatma Gandhi and Jawaharlal Nehru, who is uh, India's first prime minister, actually tried to convince India's Muslim leader, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, to stay as one country, but Ali Jinnah rejected those two leaders' pleas. And the population itself was already uh, fighting each other, so it was too little too late. And what happened during this bloody civil war is that the Hindus that were in the northwest and northeast parts of the country started to move more towards the center. And the Muslims that were in the center of the country started to move up towards the north. And so when all of this was over, there was a Hindu majority nation in the center called India and a Muslim majority nation in the Northeast and Northwest areas called Pakistan. Pakistan though was handicapped from its origin because its two parts, East Pakistan and West Pakistan were not geographically connected. Sandwiched in the middle of them was this Indian province province of Kashmir, which actually today is still considered to be disputed territory between India and Pakistan, and also between India and China. So in 1971, a military junta in West Pakistan began an ethnic cleansing or a genocide against the Bengali population in East Pakistan. And this is a conflict known as the Bangladesh War of Independence. So why is it that the Pakistani and Bengali populations hated each other so much if they were technically both united under this country? The answer is that the Pakistani and Bengali populations were obviously ethnically different. They also had different languages. Pakistanis, for in instance, speak Urdu, whereas Bengalis speak Bengali. They have different customs and cultures, and crucially, Though both Pakistanis and Bengalis are overwhelmingly or predominantly Muslim, the Pakistani population resented the Bengalis for allowing a minority Hindu population to live in East Pakistan. So that was one of the primary motivations for the ethnic cleansing. And in fact, during that 1971 war, war, excuse me, the uh, Hindu population in East Pakistan Pakistan was primarily targeted and genocided. But at the end of the war in late 1971, the two parts of Pakistan were sundered politically from each other once and for all. 
West Pakistan became known as Pakistan, and East Pakistan became its own independent country known as Bangladesh. By the way, before we go back to uh, the history of India, the 20th century is so interesting because it was really the century where Muslims around the world felt like the power and prestige that their culture had enjoyed for centuries of world history had diminished. In 1919, after World War I, the Ottoman Empire uh, collapsed, which was really a big deal because the Ottoman Empire for since, since the 15th century ruled over parts of Northern Africa, the Middle East and Europe, and it's had, it had its splendorous capital in Constantinople and it was known as one of the greatest world powers. So to see that t collapse in the early 20th century was pretty stunning. And then just about 25 years later, in 1948, the state of Israel was founded, which Palestinians refer to as Nakba or the catastrophe. And then we see here that in 1947, the Muslims had to leave the Indian subcontinent. And then there was this massacre of Bengalis, who are again, overwhelmingly Muslim in 1971. So the 20th century, is the, the developments, I should say, of the, the Muslim world in the 20th century are really important to understand to get a sense of the way that Muslims feel today, especially towards the West. So from 1947 through the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, the uh, Prime Minister of India, Nehru, and his daughter and his grandson ruled the country, and their party, the Congress Party of India, was dominant. So when Prime Minister Nehru died in the 1960s, his daughter, as I just said, Indira Gandhi, which by the way, she has no relation to Mahatma Gandhi. Indira Gandhi just married a guy with the last name Gandhi, which makes it very confusing, but still, it's important to know, no relation to Mahatma. Nehru's daughter, Indira Gandhi, took over as prime minister. She was elected and she ruled until her assassination in the 1980s. And then her son, Rajiv Gandhi, was prime minister until he was assassinated in 1991. So it's important to know about this Nehru Gandhi dynasty of prime ministers, if you will, is that unlike Modi today, they were secularists. They did not care as much as Modi does about seeing a Hindu national character uh, in India. They allowed for a lot of religious pluralism. And also unlike Modi, who is pretty pro-capitalist and pro-business, the Nehru Gandhis were quite socialists, meaning that they levied high taxes on the population. There was heavy regulation of industry. The government was anti-business and owned the means of production and redistribution distribution and the government was very corrupt and the populace was extremely poor at the time. And it's worth noting, the government still in India today is quite corrupt and large swaths of the population are poor, but compared to what it was back in the 20th century, there's been a great improvement. So I just mentioned that Nehru's daughter, Indira Gandhi, and Nehru's grandson, Rajiv Gandhi, were assassinated. And Mahatma Gandhi, as many of us know, was famously assassinated in 1948. So as I indicated earlier in the program, it's pretty stunning to think about. In the first 40 years of Indian independence, three of its most prominent leaders were killed. So I wanna briefly tell you the story of the assassination of Indira Gandhi and her son, Rajiv Gandhi, because it is really fascinating. So during the time of Indira Gandhi's uh, prime ministership, again, uh, using that word, whether or not it really is a word, uh, there was a dispute between the Sikhs and the central government of India. So the Sikhs are a religious population that is also an eth ethnic group. And this is uh, the same with Jews, obviously. The Jews are both a religion and an ethnic group. And the Sikhs primarily lived in Northern India in a province known as Punjab. And what happened was in the 70s and 80s, many militant Sikhs wanted to establish their own autonomous state. And the Sikhs started killing Hindus living in Punjab, and they also started killing many of their own who opposed their desire to have that autonomous state. 
the government of India, at the direction of Prime Minister Indira Gandhi, decided to capture these militant Sikhs who were part of the separatist movement. And they launched a military effort known as Operation Blue Star. In June of 1984, Sikhs were hunkered down in the Golden Temple, which is this marvelous sacred temple in the province of Punjab. My producers are going to put up a picture of that temple now. It is, again, just glorious. The Sikhs were in this temple because it happened to be a Sikh holiday. And this is the time when, at the direction of Indira Gandhi, uh, the Indian military launched Operation Lone Star, and they stormed the capital and killed many Sikhs, including the Sikh main spiritual leader. This was, again, in June of 1984, and obviously it caused a lot of uh, uprising and unrest among the Sikh population. And in October of that year, Indira was in her courtyard of her presidential palace when two of her bodyguards opened fire on her. On her. They shot and killed her, and it turns out that these two bodyguards were Sikhs. Now, it's interesting. I don't know if Indira Gandhi knew that her bodyguards were Sikhs. Uh, if, if she did know that they were Sikhs, it was probably not the smartest move on her part to keep them on her security team in the wake of what happened with Operation Blue Star. But still, these two Sikh bodyguards assassinated Indira Gandhi. Then her son, Rajiv Gandhi, as I said, was elected as the next prime minister, and he was killed uh, in a suicide bombing in 1991 by a Sri Lankan militant who was part of a Sri Lankan separatist group. And this militant resented Rajiv Gandhi for uh, India withdrawing its support in the Sri Lankan civil war. The 20th century, I, I just mentioned that it was a really pivotal century for the Muslim population of the world. It was also a century of so many assassinations. We had Archduke Franz Ferdinand in Austria in 1914, Gandhi in 1948, Patrice Lumumba, who was the first democratically elected leader of the Congo in 1961, President Diem in South Vietnam in 1963, President Kennedy, his brother Robert Kennedy, Martin Luther King also in the 60s, and then Indira Gandhi and her son Rajiv Gandhi. By the way, this right now is inspiring me to do a show on assassination. So you have my word that I will dive more into this because it just seems like the 20th century was an especially prevalent uh, scheme of 100 years to have so many killings. So in modern Indian history, there has continued to be conflict between Hindus and Sikhs until the first Sikh prime minister of India was actually elected in 2004. But the far bigger religious conflict has not been between Sikhs and Hindus, but actually between Muslims and Hindus. There have been a lot of terrorist attacks on, on the part of uh, Muslim Pakistanis who are uh, angry at India for what happened in uh, 1947 and also for India's uh, uh, Hindu population that again resided in East Pakistan in 1971. So the most famous example of a terrorist attack occurred in 2008 when a Muslim terrorist group from Pakistan launched a series of coordinated attacks at train stations, hotels and movie theaters in Mumbai, including at that train station, that marvelous architectural structure that I mentioned to you a few minutes ago. And this wave of terrorist attacks in 2008 some really cemented Hindu and Muslim divides, and it made the election of someone like Modi much more likely. So now, bringing us to the present day, in 2014, Narendra Modi took over as Prime Minister of India. And as I said, he is pro-capitalist, pro-business, but one of the things that he is most criticized for is his Hindu nationalism. He believes that uh, India is primarily a Hindu country and their national character should reflect that. So he has talked about wanting to bring back a Hindu renaissance of art and culture. Modi has been criticized though for his policies towards the Muslim minority population in India. There are about 200 million Muslims living in the country. And specifically, he's under fire for a 2019 Citizen Amendment Act bill, which he passed into law. 
This bill allows fast tracking for citizenship for Hindus, Buddhists, Jains, Christians, and other religious migrants from neighboring countries. But the one religious group that is exempted in that act is Muslims. Modi argues that the law is designed to help those groups that I just mentioned flee persecution from the Muslim majority countries that they are living in, such as Afghanistan, Bangladesh, and Pakistan. So there is no need for him to include Muslims as part of those uh, religions uh, for which India is offering a refuge and citizenship. Finally, if we can just zoom out for a minute, the nationalist movement that is going on in India is part of several nationalist movements that have been going on around the world in the past couple of years. We have President Bolsonaro in Brazil who has talked about wanting to get rid of foreign, primarily Iranian and Chinese influence in the country. We have President Trump here in America who has spoken very strongly about his America first policies and his isolationist foreign policies. We have Georgia Maloney in India, who, or in India, in Italy, excuse me, who says that Italy needs to come back to its Christian roots. There's Viktor Orban in Hungary. There's Erdogan in Turkey. There was Shinzo Abe, who was assassinated in Japan. He was a staunch nationalist who wanted to amend uh, Japan's constitution to allow it to militarize more, to defend itself against China. And perhaps the most prominent example is that we see a large nationalist movement going on right now in Taiwan in the face of a possible Chinese invasion. People in the media seem to get hysterical about th these nationalist movements and they paint all of them as far right. And certainly we can't paint all of them with one broad brush, whether that broad brush is painting them in a good way or a bad way. But it is worth noting that most countries throughout the majority of history have been nationalist. What happened though was that after World War II, people had this idea that nationalism was a bad thing and understandably so, that's, you know, one can understand why people were scared because with the Germans and the Japanese, we saw the most egregious extremes of nationalism take center stage. But after World War II, we saw many of these world groups and organizations become established. The United Nations, for instance, NATO, the European Union, the World Economic Forum. And there was this idea that if we could bring countries closer together and have them uh, have closer relations with one another, then another world war wouldn't erupt. In some ways, this binding of countries together has been a good thing. For instance, it's facilitated more trade across country lines, which has facilitated good relations. But what's also happened is that this binding together has gone a bit too far. For instance, in the European Union, all of these countries have one common currency and many people in, in these countries resent that leaders from other countries get to make decisions pertaining to their own country's economics. And they say, you know, don't we have a right to our self-determination and our autonomy in decision making? So this nationalism worldwide is a push to say we are sick and tired of other people running affairs for us or getting a say in our country's business. Timeless will certainly continue to keep you updated on the many developments going on in India, and I hope you found this primer of India's history to be helpful. Thank you for joining us today, and each of our thoughts, choices, and actions shape who we are. So let's think clearly, choose wisely, and act with principle and determination. See you tomorrow. <laughs>